Isaiah 53, verses one to six. Please stand for the reading of God's word. Who has believed what he has heard from us? And to whom has the arm of the Lord been revealed? For he grew up before him like a young plant and like a root out of dry ground. He had no form or majesty that we should look at him and no beauty that we should desire him. He was despised and rejected by men, a man of sorrows and acquainted with grief. And as one from whom men hide their faces, he was despised and we esteemed him not. Surely he has borne our griefs and carried our sorrows. Yet we esteemed him stricken, smitten by God and afflicted. But he was pierced for our transgressions. He was crushed for our iniquities. Upon him was the chastisement that brought us peace. And with his wounds we are healed. All we like sheep have gone astray. We have turned every one to his own way. And the Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all. Please be seated. It's an interesting experience looking out at you under the spotlight. I know you're there, but I can't really see your faces. But we're looking at this evening, this Good Friday at Isaiah 53 that's just been read out. And so if you keep that open, that will help us. We spend the next few moments together in this great passage uh, in the Bible. I suppose um, most of us are familiar with the very common cultural tendency in our day, in our age, in America and around the world of branding on your iPhones, um, on your shoes, as a brand. Uh, One very famous one is uh, Nike, which has its swoosh. That's a particular kind of of branding. Of course, branding can uh, be a wonderful thing. It can also get you into a little bit of trouble, like uh, the uh, fairly recent Pepsi commercial discovered, or even... United Airlines are having some branding difficulty these days, I hear. Religions also have um, a sign or a symbol that's associated with their faith. You know, Christianity alone, of all major movements, corporations, institutions and religions has as its symbol a brand that is associated with brutal death and total failure. It was ridiculed when it first came out. There's a very famous uh, wall painting uh, in the catacombs in Rome that shows a Roman slave worshipping a man on a cross. Uh, The man is drawn with a donkey's head. And underneath is uh, the graffiti uh, dripping with sarcasm that the slave worships his God. But uh, whereas the Roman legions, which of course had their own sign of power, did their own thing, the disciples of Jesus carried with them a message that in time to come they embedded into their buildings and put on their graves the cross. Why? Ever since the beginning, people have wondered. Uh, It's like having a hangman's noose or firing squad as your logo. And actually, some contemporary theologians have even been wondering whether the cross, with all its associations of failure and brutality, is the right corporate logo for Christianity anymore. Uh, They have thought that it was at best a... um, recent edition 
or at worst, an invention of later ancient Christian ages. Which is why it is interesting to look at what the prophet Isaiah said in these famous words in Isaiah 53, so very long ago, a long time before Jesus was even born, let alone died. The passage we're looking at in just the next few moments is structured uh, in two sections. The first is the suffering servant's suffering, observed and misunderstood. Who has believed the message of this suffering servant? And the second section from verse 4 to the end is this suffering explained. Why explained? Well, the first section, verses 1 to 3, Isaiah asks the question of many a preacher of the cross uh, ever since. Who has believed the message? Now, the reality is that the Christian faith is the largest faith in the world. And those who preach the gospel are the only people who are statistically seeing growth in terms of data and numbers by people coming to personal faith rather than growth by merely procreation. China now has millions and millions of Christians and the church in the East is expanding actually at unprecedented rates. Nonetheless, it is true that when someone really begins to get to grips with this message, there is an initial resistance, and unless God's Spirit intervenes, an ongoing resistance to the very idea of the cross. Uh, he, uh, verse 2, was young, not an aged, influential, experienced patriarch, a mere kid. Uh, he came from Nazareth, the dry ground. He was from South Side Chicago, not from Upper East Side Manhattan. A carpenter, not an uh, Ivy League uh, law school graduate. And scandal of all scandals. In our beauty obsessed celebrity culture, he was not good looking. He had no form or beauty that we should look at him and no beauty that we should desire him. You know, for all the TV and movie descriptions of Jesus that have been, some better than others, of course, I have never yet, even among the better ones, seen a single one that has depicted Jesus as physically unattractive. And yet, other than that he was presumably a Middle Eastern Jew in appearance, Jesus' physical lack of attractiveness is the only sure description we have of how he looked. He was not much of a looker. You would not put him on the front cover of a celebrity magazine. And in addition, he was not the life and soul of the party. If someone is not good looking, at least they should be funny. Upbeat, high energy. Oh, but no, he was a man of sorrows and acquainted with grief. What a party pooper. He is the very opposite of a leader by the world's standards. And yet, of every human figure throughout history, this Jesus is factually the most important person who ever lived and died. Why? Well, verses four to six explain. And uh, through them all, there is an inescapable description of an exchange. He has borne our griefs. He carried our sorrows. He was pierced for our transgressions. He 
was crushed for our iniquities. By his wounds, we are healed. We went astray like wandering clueless sheep, and the Lord laid on him the iniquity, the sin of us all. Uh, Bible teachers down through history have a phrase for this exchange, deeply unpopular among some contemporary critical scholars, but inescapably taught in this ancient text. Penal substitution. He took the penalty we deserved as our substitute. He took the wrath that was rightfully ours, the punishment that was rightly ours. He took it himself that we might be healed, have peace and joy. It's not a brand, it's the power of God. And some say it's not just. Well, God is the one who did it, and God is just. Jesus voluntarily took it. Jesus has a special relationship to his people as their representative. He is our shepherd. And Jesus, as fully man, was right to take the punishment, and as fully God, was able to pay the eternal price for that punishment. We all, and he has taken for us all. Now let me ask you this, does that us include you? Surely there is no more important question that we could possibly ask ourselves tonight. Does this us include you? Well, when you read this verse and you hear it echo within your mind, do you sense your sin? If you do, I'm encouraged. It's a sign of God's work in your life. When you read this verse and hear it echo in your mind, does something rise up within you that says, I trust him? For if you do, your sin is laid on him. How great must be our sin. How great must be his love. How great is our security in him. And how great is Jesus' claim upon our lives. Not a brand, the power of God.